Okay? So, is this misspelled? No, it's not. So you're looking at this uh, in the Greek version. So the New Testament all uses Latin endings for the ancient names, okay? So it's perga, not perge. Ephesus, S-U-S rather than the Greek, S-O-S. Pergamon is the Greek, it's said instead of Pergamum. So when you're traveling around and see the variant spellings, so they're not misspelled, one's using Greek endings, uh, and the New Testament uses Latin endings. So just a, a quick okay. heads up here. <laughs> so this is the road to Magadus going to the south. And near the village of Oxo, where we we're going to have lunch a little bit later, there was a branch that went to Italia. And then we came in that way, and we'll go all the way back on that. And the modern road basically is laid right over the Roman road. And we'll see that because there's bridges still in existence. So a Roman bridge on the north side, a later restored bridge on the south side. So the road went in that direction. But there was a, a spur then that went in that direction, whereas the road to Magadus to the port just continued. So this is the way that Palm Barnabas came into the city through this pulp part. Now, just a couple of years ago, the archaeologists here from the Antalya Museum were excavating this monumental tomb right here. And so uh, the cemeteries of these ancient cities were at the city gates on the outside. So very seldom was somebody buried inside a city. So mm -hmm. they're on the outside. And this happens to be the large funerary monument of a woman named Pontia Magna. And we'll be talking about her more when we get inside the city. Mm -hmm. But the status of women was very different in Asia Minor than in Greece, Israel, Italy. So uh, she was a very important woman. Uh, who lived in the city, and she was a, actually a descendant through her mother of King Herod. And so the Romans used in, uh, in certain areas what they call client kings. So instead of having direct Roman rule and establishing a province, if things were going all right, they used a local ruler like King Herod, who ruled and his sons after him over uh, parts of Israel, not just the province of Judea. And so this is Pontia Magna's mother, Miriam, uh, grandmother Miriam, then, who was uh, married to one of the wives of King Herod and part of the client kings that ruled in this part of the world. So we'll talk more about her when we see an inscription here a little bit later. I was reading a report about the marble that was found here. There are no marble quarries nearby here. That's they used in antiquity. They actually brought the marble from three places, from, the, from near Athens, from uh, Proconesus up in the Sea of Marmara near Istanbul and from Dokoman, which is in central Turkey. So they're able to actually check the stone and they know what quarries now they came from. And Perga had a river port about two miles to the east. So this is a flat river bottom there. So they would bring the, the stone to the mouth of the river, lo loaded onto barges, and then bring it up the river on the barges and then roll it across uh, the flat area here into the city. And so later when you see the beautiful uh, marble sarcophagi in the museum, uh, that stone was all brought in, it's not local. This stone that we're looking behind us here, uh, you see, uh, anyone know what kind of stone that is? That is not marble, what kind of stone is it? Granite. Granite, yeah. So we know exactly where this comes from. It comes from Alexandria Troas. So if you remember Paul, this is where he had the vision of the Macedonian man saying, come over. So he went through uh, Troas at least three or four times on his journeys. But just east of Troas, uh, we still have marble, or I should say, granite quarries there with these columns still laying there. We can look at them that for some reason they, they stopped uh, pulling them out and shipping them out of there. And you see this granite everywhere, and you can immediately recognize uh, Troas granite. Okay. Uh, and so I was in Spain a couple years ago, uh, outside of Barcelona at a site, and I looked at it, I said, that's Troas granite. I walked up there and they had the sign from Troas, Turkey. <laughs> and so they shipped it all over the Roman Empire, and they used it extensively here in, in uh, Perge as well. So I want to mention two things quickly. So again, you're seeing structures space that would be part of every Greco-Roman city, okay? Just like you go into a, a modern city today, you're gonna see the town square and the city hall and the 
theaters and the opera and things like that, just the basic structure. So Paul uses this space in the same way as he did the stadium to teach spiritual truth. So, I mean, we all know the word that came into uh, uh, English, agoraphobia, right? Fear of the open spaces. So this is the word that we get from this space called the agora. But Paul uses it when he's teaching about uh, freedom from sin. And the verbal form of agora, agorizo, is used by Paul twice in 1 Corinthians. This is the place not only for buying, selling fruits and vegetables and meat and things like that, but also the place where slaves were bought and sold, okay? And so he says to the Corinthians, you were bought with a price. And the word is agorazo there. So he's using the idea of a slave being redeemed from the marketplace for us as being redeemed from sin by the blood of Jesus Christ. So uh, again, that whole idea of redemption a spiritual sense being drawn out from what happened uh, here in the Agora. The other thing Paul addresses uh, as well in 1 Corinthians is the whole issue of meat sacrifice to idols. Now that's not a big deal for us today, but in, uh, for Paul's Gentile audience, this was a, a big deal. Now, Jews would never come into this space and buy meat. Why? It's not, not, it's not kosher, okay? Jews in the cities would have their own butchers that were doing kosher butchering and they would buy their meat there. So where did the meat come from here? Well, it'd be first taken to a pagan temple. Here we have an Artemis of Pergaia, who is the, the main goddess of this city. We don't know where her temple is. The archeologists haven't found it. Is it on one of these hills around here? You see a reference to her inscription over there. So uh, they'd take the carcass up there. They would slaughter uh, the, the cow. In the same way as with the priests in Israel, they would take the entrails, they would burn them on the altar, give some of the portion of the meat to the priests and the priestesses there. And then they would take the rest of the carcass down to the, now the Greek word is makellum, or excuse me, the Latin word makellum here, or the agora, and this is where they would sell the meat. So for some of the Gentiles, there was a big question, can we buy, eat the meat that is sold in the meat market, public meat markets like here. And so Paul is then giving him a bit of a lesson. He says, we don't believe that these gods are really real, the gods and goddesses. So, you know, the animal taken up and presented before Artemis, you know, these are not a reality for us. So he says, if your conscience allows, you're free to eat the meat that's sold in the public meat markets. But he says, if your conscience is weak, so what if you are a follower of Artemis? What if you had been to the temple regularly? You've been a part of, of these sacrifices that are going on there. And every time you eat that piece of steak, you're thinking about its connection to the, the pagan connection to Artemis. And so he's saying, if your, your conscience doesn't allow you, don't eat that meat. And if you know somebody has a weak conscience, don't serve them that meat you know, when you're having fellowship with them. So it's a very active issue. Now, he does say something not to do. So many of these temples also had dining halls and they would have banquets there. They would have birthday parties. They would have guild meetings like ancient unions in them. And as a, in these contexts of these uh, banquets then, they would be offering up sacrifices and prayers to the pagan deities. Now Paul says that's a step too far. If you are a King James or New King James reader, when you're reading the account in Acts 19, and the crowd is shouting for two hours, they're shouting what? Great is, no, Diana of the Ephesians. So notice, Diana, so this is her Latin name. Artemis is her Greek name, okay? And so the King James, for whatever reason, chooses to use her, her Latin name uh, in that text with the new King James following. So Diana of Pergamene, so Plankia Magda, and we have the same thing, Artemis Pergaia, Plankia Magda in Greek here. So we have many inscriptions mentioning her around the city. So she is this famous benefactress. In a similar role, remember Paul when he's writing about Phoebe in the port city called Kenkere. So, so he mentions the fact that she has helped in. Lydia is kind of the same way. These are wealthy women 
uh, who are business women, uh, not of the same elite level of Plakia Magna, but become benefactors. Of course, even Jesus had the, the women traveling with him who took care of uh, needs. So fulfilling that uh, role of a of, of uh, the, the word we get from Greek is a eurgetes or eurgetism of benevolence of, of sponsoring and what she did here is she sponsored the whole renovation of this so you can see how she modified the tower gate here built this with the niches here put statues of her father who was a very famous Roman senator he was the governor of Bithynia her brother who was very famous too put their statues here and then on this side, put all the legendary founders like Mopsus and Calchas and all these tr uh, cities like to trace their way back to the time of the Iliad and the antiquity to give them, you know, more credence and stature. So she transformed this into a city, city museum, uh, helped to build a gate to Hadrian here. So, I mean, she is a big deal in the city. We have a small chapel right here. So one of the reasons we can tell is we have this part architecturally that we call an apse. So we'll see this in all the churches that we are a part of. And uh, in this uh, apse always facing east. Now, the fact that this is built here, remember we're talking and we're looking at a city, we're looking at ruins that are over a thousand years. What is unusual about the siting of this chapel? It's, it's in the city, but what's it over? It's over the water channel. So what is that telling you about the water channel when this is built? It wasn't running. It wasn't operating. Yeah. So in a later period, a result of earthquakes, and we'll be talking about this, the cities would be knocked down. They'd rebuild. Finally, they get to a point that say, <laughs> We're going to quit doing that. So the population here has shrunk. Notice how small it is. So Christian community is smaller. The aqueducts, the water has stopped flowing. So they just take a bunch of the stone that's around here, slap it together, and build a small chapel. So this probably dates before the city is abandoned, uh, 8th century, 9th century, quite late, when the city has shrunk in size and the wealth of the city has greatly diminished. So and then they would have shops. Now this is probably a shop that's later converted into some kind of sacred space. You see the niche on the, the wall there that typically signifies uh, something sacred. And then we have a scene uh, out of the Iliad here uh, from the Trojan War. So all education in antiquity centered on Homer. Everybody studied the Iliad and the Odyssey, so they could simply look at the depiction. They've got inscriptions telling of the characters. They knew the whole story. So it's a bit like when I was talking about yesterday with the early church. They, they, they mentioned Balaam and Balaam, so the Christians would immediately know the whole story behind these. So he doesn't have to tell them. He, you know the backstory. So they knew the backstory here. And Paul, uh, being raised in Tarsus. Uh, he would have studied Homer. That was the textbook of the ancient world, and he knew these stories as well. Uh, obviously knew the pagan nature of them. Uh, as, as a Jew, uh, they weren't true, but uh, these were the, the legends that uh, everywhere you go, you'd see mosaics depicting scenes, you would see characters from the, uh, from the story, and it was just uh, the, the whole culture and history of uh, the Greco-Roman world was, was built uh, on the Iliad and the Odyssey. And, uh, Roman history later with the Aeneid built on the survivors from the Trojan War that eventually made it to Rome. So, uh, very interesting. This is constructed about 200 years after the time of Paul of Barnabas. So, obviously, it's put here for the wow factor. So, you come through the city gate and say, wow, this city must really be wealthy to have something that's spectacular. So, this is the north bath. So, just think of the equivalent of what we went through on the south side. This would have been here during uh, the time of Paul and Barnabas. And so typically travelers, after being on the road for a day, they would go into the bath and clean off. So, yeah, you, you know, we can imagine maybe Paul and Barnabas uh, used uh, either of these baths during their travels and regularly. I mean, 
this is how people clean themselves. You didn't have a bathroom in your own apartment or room, so you, you used the public baths, and uh, they would have been no different than anybody else. So, so if you want to walk through the gate, uh, it was out this way that they went to Pacinian Antioch and came back in on their first journey. So again, you're at a place where uh, biblical history was made, yeah. you know, uh, here on the first journey. So uh, one important thing that we miss when we read in Acts 13 about Paul's ministry in, in the city of Antioch, it says that he goes into the Korah, or, and the, oftentimes the translations will say he's in, in the region, but he's really in the countryside. So when we think about these ancient cities, 80% of the people lived in the countryside. Mm -hmm. they're, they're, it's an agrarian society. Even and the, the rich people had their own estates and their villas out there. And uh, they're slaves and they're, they're growing you know, the olives and vegetables and uh, wheat and uh, uh, vines and things like that. And so the majority of the people there in the Korah. So one of the big discussions has been or a focus on Paul's urban ministry in the cities, because we think about the New Testament being centered in cities. But from the very beginning in the book of Acts, we see Paul going into the, the Korah. So all the villages that were around the city of Antioch, Paul and Barnabas could have walked to within a day. And so people would invite him out there, and I think we see this pattern over and over again. So the whole area between Lystra and Derby, for example, is even today in Turkey, there's hardly anybody living there. But in the ancient times, there was shepherds and, and farmers that were living there, and Paul's traveling through there, and he's preaching to these people in the countryside. So when we think about an ancient city, Paul writing, say, to the Philippian church or the Thessalonians, he's not talking just about the urban area, but he's talking about the majority of the population that's living in the Korah.